paranormal experiences don't really work to a time scale, and therefore we invite you to listen to a dark mini sun. Hello everyone and welcome back to our second mini-sode of season 15. Firstly, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your feedback on welcoming back the mini-sodes for this season. Of course, for season 15, we will be one mini-sode short, due to the individual who sent me the first mini-sode asking at the very last moment for me not to air it. So please bear that in mind if you do submit anything to our email address, contact at thedarkparanormal.com. Now, for this mini-sode, I need to give a huge thank you and shout-out to our listener, Kat, because our team informed me they've been in touch and quite rightly corrected me on a mistake I've made. Now, you may well remember at the end of episode two, where we covered Pixie's experience, I said that in the following mini-sode, we would complete her experience because she did have an addendum at the end of her email which I didn't feel was proper to read directly following the experience. But I simply forgot to put it in. So our listener Kat, and I'm sure many of you out there, reached out and informed me that I'd made that mistake. So thank you very much because I do indeed want to share the rest of that email with you. And we're going to do that today, right now, before we start today's mini-sode. If you recall Pixie's experience, it's where her friend went into, well, what they assumed was a fake trance. And her and her friend were even so sceptical, they assumed she just picked a name from a graveyard as opposed to being possessed by the alleged spirit. However, it was when things started happening to Pixie, she began to believe that that alleged possession that she witnessed was in some way connected to a type of ritual. A ritual done to pass the malevolent spirit on to Pixie. Well, as Kat rightly pointed out, I did say I'd finish the email but I did feel a duty of care to not read out the following immediately after you heard the tale. Especially as I'm aware some of our listeners are younger than I imagined, and maybe therefore more impressionable than others. Now, although I created this very show to prove how real, terrifying and dark the paranormal can be, and I don't even mind if we cause the occasional nightmare. After all, that's the very essence of the show. It's to not focus on the lighter side, it's to focus and realise that these things are out there, these things are watching us, these things exist. So, although I'm completely fine with giving our listeners the occasional sleepless night, myself included, believe me, Pixie's addendum did have the potential to do slightly more than that to an impressionable mind. So I thought it best to do the experience and leave a few days before reading out the addendum. But as Kat rightly pointed out, I forgot to do it. So without further ado, this is Pixie's addendum. And I'll explain at the end, well, it should be clear why an impressionable mind may have been slightly tipped over the edge by the ending of the email. Addendum I spent two days writing this. It was a lot. And the real crazy stuff happened so long ago, I've even left some stuff out. If I'm being completely honest, I haven't thought about all of this in a very long time. The goings-on started to come back the more I listened to your podcast. After I finished the end of this last night, and I saved it for a read-through, it was about 1am. I have home security cameras. I happened to look up at the monitor. 
and there was a glowing ball of light in my driveway, right next to my car. My son, nineteen, heard me say, "What the f is that?" and came out of his room to make sure everything was okay. He knew my husband was already in bed. We stood in awe for what felt like an eternity. Finally, I said, "Stay here and get your phone out. I'm going out." But there was nothing. I looked at the camera, and I saw the light was on. Thinking maybe it was a bug on the lens or something, but there was nothing there. My son said, as I walked out the door, the ball of light shot away. I tried to look back on the footage, but it wasn't there. It was just me looking crazy, running around my driveway in the middle of the night for no reason. When we were in the midst of the goings-on, we learned if we spoke his name out loud, things would happen. We treated him like Lord Voldemort, but well before Harry Potter was even a thing. Apparently, if you type out his name, it's just like speaking it aloud. Fourteen hours after the light appeared, and there are still bumps, knocks, strange noises outside, and it's not just me hearing them. My pitbull, my Rottweiler, they're both reacting to them too, even when I don't hear them. I apologize again. I know this is all over the place. I felt some sort of way writing it all out, reliving it, almost like if I was to tell you and your listeners, you all might be plagued by him. I certainly hope not. No one else needs to experience this. Regards. Pixie. Now you may ask, well, what was wrong with that? Well, quite simply, if you didn't pick up on it, there Pixie implies that by listening to the tale, you may well experience the entity that she encountered. Now you may well think that's nonsense, but Lord Voldemort mentioned by Pixie there. There's a reason J.K. Rowling chose that name, as in you can't say the name. He who shall not be named, and it comes from an old English superstition that if you say the name of a witch, it gives it strength, even if it's dead. And the more you say the name, the more likely that witch is to raise from the dead and come after you. Also, she implies, in a way, this entity is like a tulpa, as in the more you think or focus on the entity, the more likely it is you will see it or experience it. And from experience, I know that that can be quite jarring to a young mind. It's an experience I'll save for some point later down the line. But I was once aged seventeen, so arguably going into adulthood, not a child by any means. And a gentleman said to me, he was unsure whether he should share his paranormal experience with me, because he was genuinely concerned if he did so, he would pass it on to me. Now, being seventeen and obviously into the paranormal. I pressured and pressured and pressured, and he told me his paranormal experience, which was downright terrifying. But the most terrifying part of the entire experience was his first warning, that he was scared to tell me in case it passed on to me, and it was that line that kept me awake for a solid week. And it was that that I didn't want to do to another teenager who may be interested in the paranormal. I want to keep people interested in the paranormal. I don't want to turn people off, and I certainly don't want to imply to people 
by listening to the show, you're going to experience XYZ. We've covered this many times before, and that's simply not the case. And even though we've even had a listener write in to say they were listening to the show and it began repeating the same phrase, so much so they pulled over in their car and in doing so, missed a very nasty accident in the car. That's still, arguably, coincidence. So, as important as it is to leave your disbelief at the door to get the most out of these experiences, it's also equally important to leave your fear and terror at the door when you leave the sphere of a paranormal tale. Once again, a huge thank you to Kat. And now we begin this week's mini-sode, entitled Cold Hands. Hello, and thank you so much for agreeing to read my submission. I can actually hear your voice reading these words as I type them. After consideration and taking great efforts to calm down, I decided to record my experience whilst I wait for my priest to call me back. What I am about to tell you is still fresh in its impact on me, having only happened moments ago. In the interest of being as necessarily detailed as possible, allow me to briefly describe the significance of the week leading up to now. Last Sunday, my Orthodox Christian parish began taking steps towards Lent, which is a season of fasting and prayer, which is observed in order to draw closer to God. Being relatively new to Orthodox tradition, I decided to use this opportunity for the purpose of reforming myself, without going into specifics. I will say that I had concluded through prayer that it was time to ditch certain habits. I spent the next few days fasting from meat and eating only in the evenings, but I stayed well hydrated. After beginning to pray in a traditional manner at home, I ordered some church iconography, incense, Christian writings. Well, they showed up yesterday. My plan was to build a prayer corner, and upon setting everything up, I immediately loved it. If only I'd resisted the temptation that I fell into straight away after adding the finishing touches. I will here admit that the particular temptation which came for me was a small bottle of vodka that I'd brought home. Now, I'm not what you would call dependent but I certainly turn to it out of stress far too often. After having my fill, I'd done my best to sober up with a hearty meal and plenty of water, and then I went to pray. In other words, I contradicted all of the efforts to submit to God by getting inebriated. Big mistake. And, as country artist Coulter Wall sings, foolish, foolish was I. You see, aside from Lent being a season of doing the hard spiritual labour of ridding oneself of pride and sin in honour to Christ, it can also shed light on the spiritual realities around oneself. The light will expose what demon may be hiding in the dark corners of your life. Breathing shakily, sated only through its oppression of you, it can take the form of a temptation, and perhaps a temptation that welcomes in something sinister. As a consequence of this recent personal lapse, for most of today, I've lived like my old self, I thought selflessly and paid no mind to what I did last night, and I believe that this served as the green light for a dark power 
to strike. You see, after getting home from work this afternoon, with no real recognition of what I'd done, I sat down and started watching TV. At some point, inspiration struck me to make some content for my Facebook page. After I finished recording and editing the video, I saved it to my gallery. Then, when I opened my gallery, my blood turned to ice. In the second space, next to the video that I'd just made, there was a small, six-second-long video. In the thumbnail was a close-up of my face. But something was very wrong. The face was contorted in a deranged, unnaturally large and twisted smile, and the eyes were misshapen and piercing. There was a sinister red hue over the whole photo. Notice that I said, THE face, instead of MY face, because, God help me, that was not my face. The feeling of fear and dread which immediately fell upon me was visceral. The nature and effect of this photo was so profound that I was immediately aware that a demon had reached out and made itself known. There were no doubts. I deleted the photo. I could not bear to look at it any more. I even emptied the entire gallery trash so that it was gone forever. Yes, I understand that was my only proof, but I simply did not care. It was the most threatened I'd felt in my whole life. Because of this, there may be some who suggest that my superstitious views simply produced a delusion, and I don't care to prove them wrong. Experiences such as this are often highly subjective. All I can assert with confidence is that I know what I saw. Immediately after deleting the photo forever, a bout of paranoia set in. You see, the living room immediately seemed darker and eerily quiet. And I was overcome by the strongest feeling that I was certainly not alone. Something was in that room with me. And it was feeding off my fear. With urgency, I called my priest to confess everything that I'd done. But he was away from his phone. I got up quickly and headed up the stairs to the prayer corner. The whole way through the living room and up the stairs, I had goosebumps all down my neck and back. It was like I was being followed home by a school bully, the way he follows his victim around the hallway. I came before my prayer corner, crossed myself, and quickly found a prayer of repentance in a little book that I'd placed there. I froze. Right before I started to pray, I suddenly felt a renewed and widespread chill spread across my back. The sensation was like cold hands, smooth and light on my skin. I imagined that the hands belonged to some kind of entity desiring to lay claim to me. Well, I began to pray. I sincerely apologised for my backsliding, and when I was done, a stillness came. The fear and dread had left, and I very quickly became convinced that I needed to write down the experience I remembered similar experiences of demonic oppression from the dark paranormal, and I ultimately decided to submit this personal account so that you, and hopefully the audience, may use it as a cautionary tale. When you come to a point in your life where you're forced to recognise that you engage in self-destructive habits, 
as I have, do not ignore the call on your conscience to reorient yourself. When one engages in these negative behaviours, despite knowing they are wrong, they are engaging with dark forces, becoming more like them. The more that one nurtures that connection to evil forces through their self-destructive behaviour, the more unmistakable the presence of such evil becomes, until it literally places its lifeless hands on your back. Thank you for taking the time to read my experience, and I hope that your audience gained some insights from it. I will of course let you know if anything else happens. God forbid. Sincerely, and with great respect for you and your fantastic show, Jeremiah. Well, thank you, Jeremiah, for providing us with this week's minisode. And I can only say from your brief description, it does sound indeed like something is in your home. If you could give us an update on what happens with the priest, that would be fantastic mainly from a personal standpoint because I like to know how these things play out, as I'm sure our audience would too. But either way, thank you for your submission. Now, for everyone, if you have a submission you think would be good for Dark Bites or a minisode or indeed a full episode of The Dark Paranormal, then please email it over to contact at thedarkparanormal.com. And in the meantime, I'll see you all on Friday for episode 4 of season 15. Until then, stay safe and take care.